Good afternoon and welcome to our session Building and Managing Cyberphysical Production Systems. Um, today we have uh, four presentations. Uh, so time for each presentation will be about 15 minutes plus uh, enough time for questions for discussion. And I want to invite Mr. Barbieri to start with his presentation. Uh, yeah, please start. Okay, thank you very much for uh, uh, for this. So my name is Giacomo Barbieri and I am an assistant professor at the University of Los Andes in uh, Bogota, Colombia. And uh, today I'm going to present you a work uh, that is titled uh, Gemma Graphs Methodology to Enable Digital Twin Based on Real-Time Coupling, which is a work uh, that we did in collaboration with Excelgo, which is a Danish company that commercialized uh, a software called Xperior, which uh, is used in the automation industry in uh, uh, virtual commissioning and digital twin uh, applications. So uh, the, we are going to start with an introduction in which I will explain you the problem and uh, what is going to be our solution. Then uh, uh, the solution is divided in two parts. Uh, so a Gemma Graphs representation and a hierarchical design pattern. Uh, then we will apply this solution to a case study and then finally we will uh, conclude with uh, showing the result and the conclusion and future uh, work. So uh, with respect to the introduction, let's say this work uh, deals with digital twin, which is the uh, is considered the next wave in modeling simulation and optimization technology. So digital twin uh, consists in a virtual representation of a production system able to run on different simulation discipline and that is characterized by the synchronization between the virtual and the real system. So, in other words, uh, helping with the image here, we have, uh, let's say, a production system, a physical object, and uh, we have on the cyber space, we have a digital object, which is going to be a digital model. With respect to the standard uh, simulation, what happens is that the digital model, the simulation, is always synchronized with the status, current status of the, of the digital uh, model, and uh, <coughs> in this way, uh, the simulator performs uh, uh, simulation, what if scenarios and so on. And when uh, we have uh, a better uh, solution, the, uh, the new solution basically is sent back to change the status and the functioning of the physical system. Therefore, is uh, the same uh, digital twin, in other words, is the same uh, of a standard simulation with the difference that we have uh, more reactivity in the sense that the flow of, of information in between the simulation and the physical plan is completely automatized. In this way, we reach uh, better synchronization and we reach, <coughs> and we reach uh, better reactivity to, uh, in our uh, system. Uh, what is an enabling, a possible enabling technology of this, uh, of the digital twin? Is the real-time coupling of the digital model with the controller of the physical production plant? Why this? Because we have uh, that the digital model need to receive uh, the current status of the physical object, and in this way, this is, can be possible by coupling the digital models with the controllers or the physical plant. And uh, considering that in the current industrial automation system, uh, the uh, controllers utilized, uh, let's say the, the out classical automation pyramid is uh, currently utilized. And in particular, on the control level, we have PLC. Uh, we, one possibility to enable digital twin is going to be to couple the PLC with the digital models that constitute the digital twin architecture. Now, what is the, the problem here? The problem is that every, um, like programmers, uh, write a PLC code uh, as a, let's say, or every company in a different way. Whereas if we want to adapt, uh, to utilize, uh, uh, to generate a uh, uh, digital TV architecture uh, based on real-time coupling with PLC, a standard interface would be desirable in order to enable the, co the connection in between the PLC and the digital models. 
Uh, therefore, there are some standards in the literature. For example, the one that we are adopting with this, this, uh, within this work is the GEMMA guideline, which uh, was uh, uh, proposed in uh, 1981 from uh, a, French, uh, a French institution, which provides a, a common approach and vocabulary for the management of the operational modes of industrial automation system. And uh, our idea is going to generate uh, a digital theory in architectures, which is uh, basically constituted as it is here on the right. So we have uh, a cyber domain, a cyber space, space in which we have uh, all the digital twin models. Uh, whereas with respect to the PLC software of the different industrial automation system, we want to divide uh, for each uh, system the software in two layers. So a Gemma layer, which is a layer that is built uh, using this, uh, um, this uh, Gemma uh, standard in order to provide a standard interface in between the digital models and the Gemma and the PLC software. And then uh, whereas when this uh, uh, Gemma layer is common to, e to each industrial automation system, see, since each industrial automation system is characterized by uh, the same operational modes. Uh, whereas, uh, sure, based on the consider automation system, we have a nested behavior. Uh, so the behavior that is implemented with, within each operational mode uh, that is going to be different. So our idea and uh, what we are going to propose is to utilize Gemma for creating a standard interface and uh, to divide the hierarchically structure the code uh, in a Gemma layer, which is going to be the responsible for interfacing with the digital twin and the nested behavior, which is going to be personalized uh, based on the industrial automation system. In this way, we will build a standard in interface in between uh, the digital architecture and the digital models and the PLC code. Now, what is the problem to implement this? Is that Gemma is partially specified with respect to the syntax and semantics, causing possible misunderstanding and emerging behavior. Some example, the Gemma guideline does not allow to, pro to provide the initial state the, of the system. The, for example, what is uh, the exit nested state behavior? So, for example, if a transition at the Gemma layer is available, should, should I go out or should I remain until uh, in that state until the nested behavior has not been complete. Uh, if I have more outgoing uh, transition from a state, what is going to be the priorities of this transition? So all of these are few examples that uh, cause mis uh, can provoke like generate a misunderstanding and emergent behavior. So our solution that we are going to propose is uh, to reach uh, the Gemma representation with the graphs uh, standard. To, to avoid the generation of emergent behaviors, so for the specification of the PLC code, and then to generate a hierarchical design pattern that effectively generate this uh, hierarchical structure. So uh, GraphSet is a, so let's start uh, to propose the solution. So GraphSet is an international standard, which is quite familiar to the control practitioner. And uh, our idea, therefore, is to, if you can, you, uh, you see, this is the Gemma uh, guideline, which is now presented with the GraphSet standard. So uh, GraphSet enabled the use of step, macro step, and closing step, initial steps, and so on. So I'm not going into details that you can find in the paper, but uh, what I wanted to show you is that effectively we are going now to also represent to solve all the problem that we identified. For example, here we have the transition priorities and so on. And then from uh, this uh, representation, we generate, uh, uh, we identify a hierarchical design pattern to generate a PLC code in a hierarchical way. So for, in the paper, you can find a simple specification of uh, a Gemma graphs representation, and then we uh, see how we can generate a PLC code. So from a software architecture, we have a Gemma layer, which is going to be the high le level, and uh, this is going to invoke the nested behavior, which is going to be written by means of function blocks. Um, in this way, you can see that this is uh, the, implement the code implementation of the Gemma layer. And for example, we can notice that when a state is active, invoke uh, the, uh, the Gemma, let's say the representation of the nested behavior. So at the end, uh, we are able to implement uh, this uh, uh, hierarchical uh, behavior, this hierarchical PLC code. 
that will allow us from one side to generate a standard interface since the Gemma layer is going to be the one that is common to each industrial automation system and which is going to interface with the digital models of the PLC. Now, in order to validate this, we applied this approach with the, to a case study. And in particular, the case study that we used is a filling and encapsulating machine in which uh, we have uh, some bottles that uh, we have a system that constitute of three stations. So one uh, transport and feeding in which the bottles are moved uh, from one conveyor to the to the next one. Then uh, the second station dosing and filling in which we have that the bottles are filled with uh, a liquid. And then the third station, we have the encapsulating machine uh, station, the encapsulating machine in which a cap is placed on the uh, on the bottle. So in order to do this and also to give you an idea of the potential on how to use what we are going to propose, I show you the different steps that you can do to write your control code following this methodology. So the idea is that you start by selecting the Gemma states and transition. So as I was telling you, Gemma is a a proposed different a guideline that proposed different operational modes. Uh, all the operational modes that are available are pr uh, presented here. But then uh, uh, on the basis of your system, you can uh, say, OK, my system does not need uh, this, uh, for example, operational mode, does not need this operational mode and these operational modes. So uh, you, the first step uh, to give the specification of your code uh, is to identify in between all the possible uh, operational modes of your system, which are the ones that your system need. Then uh, your, uh, you are going to define Boolean, trans Boolean condition that uh, uh, in which a transition will be defined. So for example, one can say, okay, to move from this operational mode to this operational mode, uh, this transition, let's say, happens when uh, condition T1 uh, is, uh, is verified. Then uh, you are going to specify the nested behavior of each state. So here we have the, uh, uh, up to now, we specified the Gemma, um, let's say, behavior which is the high level behavior of the industrial automation system, then we are going to identify the nested. So what is the action that are performing inside each state, which are going to be uh, customized for each industrial automation system. Uh, once you do this, uh, you are now ready to identify the behavior of the Gemma layer. So not only what are the transition and the state that you need, but also what are the priorities if uh, these uh, are macro steps and closing steps. So uh, let's say you are going to detail specifying the, uh, your system and then uh, you are going to from this uh, specification, this Gemma graphs specification, you are going to generate uh, your PLC code, uh, which is done by using the hierarchical design pattern that we showed before. So uh, we, in order to test uh, these, uh, we, these were the, the specification that we uh, did uh, for that automation system. And uh, then uh, let's say we implement a digital twin architecture in which we have uh, a, a simulink model which is connected to a PLC, uh, which is connected to a production system. We use the uh, Xperior to simulate the production system, which is a, a virtual commissioning software that allows to uh, produce, to uh, simulate a manufacturing line. Um, we use Codesys as PLC and, as a, uh, and we built an HMI simulink. We know that a real digital twin is not an HMI as digital model, but as a digital model. However, let's say since we wanted just to test the interface in between the PLC code and the digital space, we decided to just use for this case study an HMI. So let's say on the paper, you can also find uh, let's say some video that we did showing the functioning of the system in which we have different operational modes and uh, uh, that we are able to manage with the methodology that we proposed. Um, so uh, I have just more minute, one more minute, so I wanted to like wrap up what we see today. So from one side, uh, the methodology that we proposed, uh, let's say I show you very high level because I wanted to 
better explain uh, the why this is useful more than the details of that that you can find in the paper. But the idea is that allow to completely specify the operational modes of industrial automation system following the, the GEMA guidelines. So solving the problem that the GEMA guideline has that was uh, um, the occurrence of emergent behavior. Then uh, from uh, this GEMA guideline, we generate a hierarchical model readable and mindable PLC code by generating a one trans one tr one to one translation of the gemma graphs specification into PLC code and this allowed the generation therefore of a standard interface interface that can enable the uh, real time coupling in between the PLC and the digital model for the implementation of a digital twin architecture. Finally, the uh, what we want to do as future work is to further validate the methodology. So in terms, for example, of performance and so on with respect to other PLC methodologies, then uh, uh, we want to uh, we want to generate code automatically from this Gemma graphs specification and eventually we want to better investigate the use of the virtual commissioning in digital twin since in this case the, the virtual commissioning simulation allowed us to generate a virtual let's call it virtual digital twin in the sense that we were able to test the digital twin functionality before its implementation on the physical plant so uh, that is all for today so uh, for this uh, uh, work so i'm uh, i'm looking forward to uh, receive some feedback comment from uh, from you thank you very, thank you much, very much for a presentation are there questions? No questions. So I have a question. Um, you speak about the simulation of this uh, physical system uh, and you speak about real-time uh, capability so all these simulation models for the physical system uh, are the simulation models so efficient that everything is possible in real time or is there still something to improve to so to make so the the technique that we used for the validation was uh, a virtual commissioning simulation and there are different types of virtual commissioning simulations so hardware in the loop uh, in which uh, you use uh, a real controller connected to a, a physical uh, model of the plant uh, but in our case we use a soft software in the loop in which we have an emulated controller which was connected to uh, digital model of the plant. Uh, during a software in the loop simulation, the two elements are synchronized, but they, they are not perfectly in real time because the idea is just to evaluate the functionality of your system. Whereas uh, if uh, you wanted to validate like no functional requirement as performance and so on, you had to use a uh, hardware in the loop simulation in which you connect the real controller, real physical controller, to a simulation model that is run in a real time uh, uh, piece, um, computer. So since in our case, the idea was just to evaluate functional requirement, we used the um, software in the loop virtual commissioning simulation. In the future that we are going to evaluate also performance uh, uh, elements, we are working on a real physical system or with hardware in the loop simulation. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, contribution. And yeah, let's turn to the second topic, towards mastering variability. Uh, Mr. Rabisa, please. I'm here, thank you. Let's try to share the screen. That's always the, the tricky part. Okay, that should work. At least it shows on my screen as working. Welcome from my side. Um, thank you for the introduction. 
my name is Rick Ravisser and I'm a professor here at Johannes Kepler University at the uh, Cyber Physical Systems Lab um, in the LIT Institute. Um, this is work by me and my colleague Alois Zeutel, who you will see tomorrow because he will be giving one of the keynotes tomorrow. Um, what is this talk about? This talk uh, is about our plans on performing research on variability in cyber physical production systems. So you cannot now expect a talk that presents a complete solution or a tool or an approach. What I will present you now is our vision and our plans for research on this topic. Um, in this context, I don't really have to introduce software intensive cyber physical production systems. I guess still I want to show some examples as a starting point. For instance, injection molding machines or steel plants, uh, blast furnaces or uh, production plants with the classical robots that you know of. And um, cyber physical production systems simply reflect the characteristics of cyber physical systems to the production domain. So what are these characteristics that we are uh, all working on? Well, I think the key thing is um, the, uh, in the, the, the interrelation between physical components and software and the various ways of communication between these two worlds and with the environment and also the adaptability. So we are in a, in a time where the increasing availability and use of distributed industrial cyber physical system devices and systems enables movement that is called industry 4.0 or that enables cyber physical production systems. But this comes with challenges. And one of the key cross cutting challenges in uh, cyber physical production systems is variability. These systems are simply highly variable systems of systems that frequently and independently evolve. What do I mean with variability? Well, variability has been defined as the ability of a system or artifact to be efficiently extended, changed, customized or configured for use in a particular context. So in cyber physical production systems, uh, when we talk about variability, we mean hardware, we mean software. We mean development processes, we mean artifacts in different disciplines, mechanical, electrical, software engineering and so on. And we mean the methods and tools. Um, it might be true that hardware is one of the most significant drivers for variability, maybe followed by market pressure and especially pressure for customization. But what um, in the end is the problem that is underlying is, is that different people with different backgrounds and different knowledge use different tools to mostly manually main different artifacts. And this can be software, but this can be also C CAD drawings, electrical plans, and many, many different types of unstructured formats and spreadsheets and documents. So how to approach the beast? How to deal with variability? First, you need to better understand what variability is about. I mean, variability has obviously an impact on all phases of engineering a system and on the organizational structures. It's mostly tacit in nature. That means it's implicitly, uh, the knowledge about variability is implicit in the heads of different people. Not all of the variability is written down and those, uh, the variability that is written down is often not written down in a, a systematic and structured way. Also, it's not only a problem of software. It affects diverse artifacts, especially in a cyber physical production systems context. Variability can be emergent, so happening while evolving and maintaining the system and developing the system, or it can be planned to allow certain features that you can actually sell to a customer. Um, and it results in principle from diverse decisions made to address requirements, be it internal requirements or external requirements. So we have a multidimensional problem here with multiple phases, multiple baselines, multiple products and variability hidden in diverse artifacts and systems uh, shown here, for instance, in configurators, in models, in code, in configuration files. So, and of course, when we talk about variability, we mean external variability that someone looking at the system like a customer uh, sees, and we mean internal variability, what's technically possible. And in times of cyber physical systems, variability at runtime becomes even more important when the system adapts itself to uh, based on what's happening in its environment. So 
why is this still a problem? Well, if you look at the existing work on variability and uh, cyber-physical production systems, you see that there's only very initial work focusing particularly on variability and cyber-physical production systems. There's some exploratory case studies, there's some challenge papers, but all and all these are mostly position and short papers. And they generally more discuss open challenges and research questions than actually uh, presenting a systematic approach. So there is a lack of systematic approaches, methodologies, methodologies or solutions not in the domain of uh, software intensive cyber physical production systems. There's a lot of work on dealing with variability in software product lines and in software in general, but there's not much work uh, on adopting this for cyber physical production systems. Um, why is this? Well, it's uh, simply a big challenge to address variability in this domain, in this context. We're not only talking about variability in the product or in the structure, we are also talking about variability in the behavior, in the data model, in the hardware. We're talking about variability in the context, like in the environment, at runtime and design time, between models, so uh, uh, intermodel, and also within different types of models, intramodel. And more and more quality requirements are important, like performance, safety, and correctness, and these are variable too. So a lot of issues to attack. Um, I could list a lot of detailed issues now. I just wanted to pick three that we put a particular emphasis on in our work. One is the, in our opinion, precarious dependence on tested expert knowledge and missing documentation of requirements. So there's a lot of test knowledge not made explicit and we want to make this explicit. Also, there's insufficient automation support. A lot of the work regarding uh, variability management and configuration is still done manually in practice. And um, people in practice industry has difficulties assessing the impact of uh, the changes they make in the requirement specification or when they maintain the software and change actual artifacts or features. What is the impact on existing variants? And in our research, um, our goal is to um, attack this in several stages and we have split our goals into seven sub goals research objectives that i want to show alongside a, a schematic approach figure this figure here on the bottom shows the solution space or so the actual system with hardware components and other components and artifacts on top of it that represent the actual system like CAD drawings, like electrical plans, like the software, like specifications, whatever. And on top of that, you have problem space uh, variability models. And that's our first research goal. We want to approach uh, the, the beast from the side of the problem space first. So we want to understand what are the features that are available, what are their interrelations, and how do they need to be configured. Um, Approaches from the field of software engineering, especially software product lines, will be a good starting point, most importantly feature modeling and decision modeling, but the challenge will be to extend and adapt these approaches to cyber physical production systems, especially because we, on, we do not only have to work with structure here, we also have to work with behavior, so we need some kind of mixture maybe between feature modeling and decision modeling. Then, we don't want to actually manually have to create and maintain these variability models. The models, the variability models are supposed to make variability explicit, but if you have to create and maintain them manually, they won't have any success in practice because uh, they won't be maintained over a long time, even if you can find the initial time and resources to create them. So we need some automation, and this means we want to automatically mine variability. Um, there's approaches in software engineering called feature identification approaches, feature extraction approaches, feature model synthesis approaches, and of course there's the whole area of information retrieval and machine learning approaches that help deal with uh, learning from existing information and data to automatically derive models from it. Um, this is a huge research goal, that's for sure, but we already have a PhD ongoing on this topic and we plan to continue with this. A particular challenge will be to deal with the heterogeneous artifacts in cyber physical production systems here. The third research goal we have is to also automatically map the problem and solution space. This means we want to keep trace links and uh, automatically maintain trace links between variability models and actual artifacts. There's different techniques that support this, most importantly feature location techniques, mostly based on static and dynamic uh, analysis 
and code analysis techniques, as well as information retrieval or hybrid techniques. But there's also work in the area of requirements engineering, for instance, traceability based approaches. And we plan to build on these approaches and uh, develop support in the context of cyber physical production systems. Problem here is this is a highly expert driven system uh, process currently, so we have to talk a lot with people to get out the knowledge needed to map problem and solution space. The fourth research objective is semantic integration. Um, what we mean by that is uh, there are engineering models of different disciplines used in cyber physical production systems using technologies like uh, or approaches like system L or AADL or automation ML. Um, and there's ontologies in the knowledge based systems uh, community. And I think these need to be brought together better, especially to really understand uh, what uh, artifact representation, how artifact representations are related with each other. What does it mean when you have a certain connection in an electrical plan and you have an uh, uh, if statement in, in code? How are these two related? But of course, we don't want to create a full domain model here. We want to uh, follow a value based approach and just model those uh, semantic information we need to deal with variability. The fifth goal is we want to automate product configuration and target artifact generation. Basically, what we want to do is if we have a variability model, we want to use it to be able to quickly derive products. And the key challenge here will be to deal with things like off the shelf products that need be to be integrated, third party components, components reused from other systems and newly built components. All those not directly being part of the platform of the product line and that need to be somehow uh, connected to what you do in product configuration. Sixth uh, research goal is consistency checking. Uh, if you have a lot of models like the variability models and the uh, semantic information, you want to ensure you don't have mistakes in there. So you want to check between uh, within these models and between different levels, whether there's any mistakes, any cycles, any problems. Um, and last but not least, we want to deal with evolution and round trip engineering. So what happens if you uh, develop the product further, if the customer develops the product further, how does this flow back into the platform or product line? How do changes made during or after deployment, during operation, find their way back into the product line? This is a process that in practice currently is mostly unsystematic and manually done, and we want to bring some more systematic in there. So these were a lot of goals. And this is because what I'm describing here is actually based on a now accepted proposal for a Christian Doppler lab. A Christian Doppler lab is a funding instrument in Austria that uh, basically has the idea of applied basic research, 50% funded by the government and 50% funded by dedicated industry partners. There's a little bit uh, deviations possible depending on the size of the industry partner, but roughly that's that's the idea. And those labs are funded uh, and founded at universities. Um, and they run for up to seven years. And we got accepted such a lab called Basics for mastering variability in software intensive cyber physical production systems that will start in February. So we are currently building up a team. Um, we are also still looking for at least the postdoc and a PhD, all the others we are happy to already have found. And in, as part of that Christian Doppler lab, we plan to uh, work on these research goals. So we want, of course, to conduct further studies but mostly we want to come up with an approach for modeling and mastering variability in software intensive cyber physical production system that supports semantic integration, that allows for model based generation and configuration of target artifacts, that provides support for variability mining and mapping, consistency checking and round trip engineering. And if you see this whole list uh, and you know that this runs for seven years, it is clear that we have some ambitious goals here. Who is our industry partner? Well, our industry partner is Prime Metals Technologies, formerly known as Siemens VEI, formerly known as First Alpine Industrieanlagenbau um, here in Linz. Uh, Prime Metals Technologies is a global leader um, in the supply of technologies, solutions and services in the metallurgi metallurgical industry, so iron, steel and aluminum across all production stages. And they not only build the mechanical equipment, the electrics and the automation, they also develop and maintain the complete IT solutions and provide service and modernization packages. So they are really a full scale uh, vendor for that. And we want uh, together with them uh, provide novel approaches to help them deal with highly variable metallurgical production plants. 
we will not do this alone. We rely on a lot of collaborations and existing uh, uh, cooperations with other universities and institutes. I've just listed some here. I don't want to read them, but depending on the topic, we are already cooperating with diverse experts here in Austria and internationally. And maybe one of you that is currently in the room wants to cooperate with us. So please just drop us a message and we will talk. That was a very brief overview. The idea of the of this whole talk was to just advertise that we are planning a lot of research in this area, that we have done some initial work and that more will be coming. And we, of course, have some initial ideas and will hopefully soon present first results. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll happily take any questions should there be some. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, are there questions? So let me start with a question. Uh, you showed the example of prime metals. Um, they are very uh, complex physical processes. Is it necessary for you for this task to understand the metallurgical processes and so on? Um, not in detail. Uh, I also guess based on, on, on our backgrounds, this won't even be possible, right? Because we, we are computer scientists, we are some of us are electrical engineers, we have mechatronics experts. So we, we understand how machines work, but the metallurgical process, how, how steel solidifies and stuff like that, that's a quite complex thing. And we rely on our domain experts there to explain to us how this works um, and mostly have to treat this more as a black box, to be honest. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? Not the case, then thank you once again uh, for your uh, presentation. And let's turn to the third. Uh, the third presentation will be uh, presented by Mr. Navas. He will speak about MT Connect based decision support system for local machine tool monitoring. Please start. I think you are still muted. Okay, now thank you. Yeah, thank you. I will share my screen. Okay, can you see all the, the slides? Yes, it's possible. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Carlos Erazo. I am an undergraduate student from the Department of Industrial and Mechanical Engineering from Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, today, I will present the paper called Empty Connect Based Decision Support System for local machine tool monitoring. This work was done together with Sepide, Alejandro and Jacob. This is the agenda of the presentation. First, I will make a brief introduction. Then uh, I will talk about the methodology. Uh, after that, I will uh, explain a little bit the empty connect architecture. Then I will present uh, our results that is related with the development of a decision support system in, in three applications, uh, which are production control, preventive maintenance, and energy consumption analysis. And uh, finally, I will mention some conclusions and future work. So uh, machine tools are indispensable components uh, in the realm of the manufacturing processes. Uh, this happens because their performances affect the production efficiency as well uh, as its effectiveness. In this way, the evolution of the machine tool technologies has been developed in the same way as the industrial revolution. This similarity confirms that the machine tools are fundamental components in the modern manufacturing systems. In this direction, similar to the industrial revolution, machine tools have passed through four stages of uh, technological development. 
The first one, which is the first industrial revolution, mechanical energy started to have an important role in the manufacturing. However, production efficiency in this case depended in a big percentage on operators. Now in the second industrial revolution, new concepts started to arrive, such as mass production, assembly lines, and electricity. Uh, and, and in addition to this, numerical control machine started to play an important role because uh, they supported the operators during the manufacturing processes. During the third industrial revolution, automation, computers and electronics had a high impact on the manufacturing sector. Now the CNC machines were introduced, which allowed the manufacturing process to be completely controlled by a computer. And this means that the production efficiency increased. And finally, uh, the idea of digitalization and connectivity appears in the fourth industrial revolution. As we enter uh, into the era of the industrial uh, of the industry 4.0, we also enter into the era of the machine tool 4.0, which involves integrated machining processes through networking, allowing for monitoring and a control of the process. In this way, new concepts start to appear, such as cyber physical machine tools, big data, Internet of Things, and highly interconnected systems, all of them offering solutions for machine tool 4.0. However, this evolution is challenging in aspects such as a communication, data communication, management, and integration. Currently, a big percentage of the of machine production, uh, which is the most common manufacturing process, is performed using CNC machines. These machines use servo motors to generate the tool motion, and they also use sensor feedbacks in order to control the cutting process. In this way, the output data from these sensors can be manipulated to examine the machining process in general. Now, uh, the question and one of the challenges is how to collect the data from the various sensors of the machine tool to perform the task of local machine tool monitoring. And to answer this, there are two possible, two possible answers, which are NT-Link or Predator. Both of them are software that are, uh, are useful to connect machines in the factory, allowing to monitor operational and production data. However, one big disadvantage of, of both of them is that they are not open source systems. So another option is MT Connect, and MT Connect uh, is an open source royalty free communication protocol, and it facilitates the data collection in a matching tool via network connection. However, the challenge is that literature cost, uh, lacks uh, cost effective tools to analyze the collected data that could easily and rapidly be deployed to analyze them and uh, collect data for enhanced decision-making process. These are two examples of a uh, related work on empty connect application. In the first one, um, there was developed a web-based machine monitoring system that collects the data and performs some analysis for uh, any empty connect compatible machines. And in the second one, uh, empty connect data was collected from a machine from a machine tool in a case study for process planning verification. Following this same direction, this paper contributes by presenting a variety of empty connect applications in facilitating the decision making process at different production levels. So uh, first, I have to make clear uh, which is uh, what is our solution for the mentioned problem. And what we propose is the development and an implementation of machine monitoring solutions, which allows for rapidly deployable decision support system. This proposal can be separated into two different parts. The first one uh, consists in the data collection from a machine tool using empty connect as the communication protocol. And in the second one, the second one is related with a Microsoft Excel based dashboard tool to organize and analyze the collected data. These are the steps that were performed in order to, to accomplish the proposed solution. The first one is data collection, 
which is made um, uh, by using MT Connect. The second one is data storage and processing, which involves transforming input data into significant information. And the third one is data analysis and utilization, which consists in the use of data visualization tools for facilitating the decision making process. Now I will talk about the MT Connect architecture, which is represented in the following figure. That figure uh, represents the data transmission from a physical device to a final application that is going to be used by an end user. This is the first layer uh, in which the real time machining data are collected from the CNC machine controller. Here it is important to mention that in this study, a collaborative work was made with Imocomp, which is a company that works on sales and distribution of matching tools. So in this way, all the, the research study was done in one matching tool uh, from Imocomp, which is the one shown in the image below. This is the second layer, which consists in two elements, the MT Connect adapter and the MT Connect agent. In the, the MT Connect adapter translates the collected data from the matching tool by assigning the data with MT Connect data items. And the MT Connect agent formats and organizes data into XML files and send them to the final application, which is the last and third layer of the MT Connect architecture. In this case, uh, the third layer consisted on the development of a decision support system with Microsoft Excel by using that information provided by the MT Connect agent. Now I will present the results of the decision support system. We developed a decision support system that involves three different applications, which are production control, preventive maintenance, and analysis of uh, energy consumption. In each of the three applications, I will present the results following the three steps that I mentioned in the methodology, which are data collection, data storage and processing, and uh, data analysis and utilization. So the first one is production control, and the first step involves um, knowing what data do we have from, from the CNC machine controller. In this case, we can have from the con CNC machine controller by using MT Connect, we can get the execution status of the machine, the controller mode, the emergency status, as well as the program name used to manufacture a part, the part count, and the date of data acquisition. Now, following the second step, we need to know what information can we obtain from this data. And the information we can obtain is the effective machining time, the setup time, the idle time, the downtime, as well as the number of parts produced and the time of data acquisition. Now, the third part, uh, which involves the visualization of the information, uh, in this part, we developed an interface uh, that is shown in the figure. And the, in this, in this uh, part, the user can choose a part to analyze as well as a start uh, and an end date. And for those specific conditions, four different graphs appear, which show the machining time, the setup time, the idle time, and the downtime. And in the bottom part of the interface, the user can see the total time of data acquisition, as well as the total number of parts produced during data acquisition. Now, how this information can be valuable? Uh, the information shown in the, in the tool can be valuable uh, for several reasons. First, we can have a individual information on the production cycle uh, time of each part, and this can help us uh, to identify unusual situations that affect machining, machine productivity by comparing with the historical data. For instance, if, if there is a, a high values on production cycle time, maybe due to high setup times. And another advantage is that the information provided in the tool uh, provides information about the machine production rate, which can be incorporated for future sales planning. Now, this is the second uh, application, which is preventive maintenance. So the first step is to know what data can we get from the CNC machine controller. In this case, we also have the execution status the controller mode and the date of data acquisition. And besides that, we can have the maintenance activities of the machine and how often those maintenance activities should be done. From this data, we can have this information, 
which is the effective machining time. The hours left before the next maintenance activity should be performed, and we can also calculate the machine usage percentage. So in the first st uh, step to visualize the information, we developed the following interface in which the user can, can see a table with three different columns. In the first one, there are all the maintenance activities of the machine. In the second one, the user can see the hours left before the next maintenance should be done. And in the third one appears the maintenance status. So if for any given uh, maintenance activities, the hours left before the next maintenance is really low, a red message appears uh, showing a critical risk. Now, how this information, how to use this information? Well, one advantage is that uh, we can perform maintenance activities based on effective machining time. And this is important because by performing maintenance activities when the machine is under or overused can have negative effects in terms of higher cost or maybe bad uh, machine tool performance. For example, by having better maintenance practices, we can get economical advantages in the company. And uh, the last advantage is uh, another advantage is that with the information provided, we can develop an accurate maintenance schedule, which help us to uh, prepare for next maintenance activities. Now, this is the last uh, application, which is on energy consumption analysis. Uh, following again the three steps. In the first one, we need to know what data do we have from the CNC machine controller. In this case, we have the date of that acquisition, the program name used to manufacture the part. We have the power rating of the machine components, which in this case are the servo motors of the CNC machine. And we also have all the load. The, this data item represents the measurement of the actual versus the standard rating of a device. In other words, uh, this value is a percentage of the maximum power rating of each component of the CNC machine tool. And in the second step, what information can we obtain from the data? Uh, from this data, we can obtain the output power of each of the components. We can calculate the total energy consumption of the machine tool. And finally, we can calculate the energy consumption for a specific part. Now, how to visualize this information? In, the, in this case, we developed this interface in which the user can see a graph that shows the output power over time for the different components of the CNC machine tool. In this case, the X, the Y, the Z axis, as well as the spindle. And the user can also see the total energy consumption by all these four components. And in the bottom part of the interface, the user can choose a part as well as select a start date and an end date and for those specific conditions, the energy consumption uh, is shown. Now, uh, how to use this information and how this information can be valuable. First, uh, we can identify unusual situations related with the output power of the machine components. For example, high output power can be a signal of a potentially unsafe operating operation of the machine. Uh, and then managers can take some decisions in order to solve this problem. In the same way, uh, today uh, we know that resource consumption in production has been really important and the information in the tool can be valuable in lean and sustainable manufacturing in order to apply strategies if needed for resource or energy minimization. And finally, with the information provided, uh, it can be useful to estimate the total cost of energy as well as the production cost per part. Now, finally, I will mention some conclusions and future work. First, uh, nowadays the decision making process has become a very fundamental activity to improve the performance of devices. And more important is that accessibility to precise information is essential to enhance, to enhance this process of decision making. In this study, MT Connect was used to communicate with the CNC machine tool for data collection. And after that, a decision support system was developed to organize, present, and visualize the information in a user friendly format and facilitate the decision making process. Now, some future work MT Connect allows to collect various types of data by installing additional sensors. This means that we can get additional information 
about the performance of the machine and make a more robust analysis if needed. And finally, uh, another uh, future work uh, is to implement MT Connect in multiple matching tools. In this way, uh, we can analyze the inter interoperability between, between different machines. Thank you very much, and I, open, and I am open to questions. Thank you very much. Are there questions from the auditorium? Okay, um, you have implemented this for the CNC machine. Yes. And um, yeah, you, you have a nice monitoring. You can see the state um, as a function of time and so. Um, did you um, mention such effect like um, operators of the machine who are surprised about uh, some information so that they suddenly see things they have not seen before, or is it not the case? Uh, well, we implemented this, this tool uh, just as uh, uh, not in, uh, in a real procedure in the manufacturing okay. processes, but just uh, as a, 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 like a test for this this machine tool monitoring. Okay, because my uh, experience in such cases is that uh, the information uh, can be very valuable for the operators and they suddenly see some uh, very important Ye things they did not see before. Yes, yes, and, and that's the idea with this tool to, to see information that can be uh, maybe not very clear before so they can uh, like facilitate that decision making process uh, for improving the efficiency of the of the machine tool or, or something like that mm -hmm. and would it be possible to optimize the energy consumption of the machine with this information i uh, we think yes because uh, as we see in the in the interface for energy consumption uh, we can see how is the performance of the machine in this in this in this uh, energy consumption. So probably we can take some decisions looking forward to minimize this this energy consumption by applying some strategies that can be useful for this. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Okay, then thank you. We are at the end of our session. I want to thank all thank all the uh, lecturers for their presentations. And I wish you good evening and a nice conference. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.